Hello. Um, welcome to Queer X. This is our very, very first time doing a live stream video of our educational programming. My name is Jason Jackson, and I serve as the Assistant Director for the Gender and Sexuality Center for Queer and Trans Life. Um, I wanted to start off by saying thank you all for being here. There are folks here in the space in the room, and there's folks on live stream. Um, one second for me. Maybe we should just leave my computer. Thank you. We're having some technical difficulties. This is our very first time doing this, so thank you so much for, for bearing with us. But we are really excited as we really wanted to make sure that our educational programming extends not just to folks who were able to be here uh, physically, but for folks on campus, um, across campus. So again, my name is Jason Jackson. I serve as the Assistant Director at the Gender and Sexuality Center for Queer and Trans Life. We will have about three more Queer X talks, but this is our very first one. So again, excuse the technical difficulties, but we will get it together for you. <laughs> However, I am so excited to be able to start off one of our very first Queer X talks. But before I, uh, we do that, I'll let you know a couple of things about how this will work. Number one, we'll have a presenter do a, a focused conversation on a particular topic that you'll be able to see on the flyers that you probably saw us promoting. The person will speak for about the first 30 minutes, or 30 minutes or so. Then the second 30 minutes, I will interrupt the space a little bit and we'll move on to a Q&A portion. That Q&A portion will be for members who are physically in the space as well as you all who are on the uh, WebEx as well. So I'll be screening some of those questions and trying to get as many of those questions to the uh, facilitator for today. So without further ado, can I say queer? I'm gonna to introduce to you our phenomenal and fabulous graduate student, Claire, who's gonna be facilitating the discussion. Oh, back up. The reason why we're doing this quote unquote, can I say queer? The Gender and Sexuality Center for Queer and Trans Life, our name is new. Many of you knew us formerly as the GLBTA Programs Office, and we felt the importance of changing our name as our communities, our identities, our political issues are also changing, and we felt important, it important to change as well. But that also comes with some backlash, some questions, some concerns about this, the term itself queer. And so we want to make sure that we center our conversation, our very first Queer X talk, on that topic in itself. So Claire has been so amazingly great, gracious to host this conversation. So a little bit about Claire. Claire is a master's of public policy student here at the university um, at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, who is also working um, on a minor in human rights. Between 2012 and 2014, she was a clinic and health team Peace Corps uh, volunteer in Botswana, where she worked on HIV AIDS prevention as well as working um, on empowerment topics with LGBTQIA communities. She is tailoring her master's degree to focus predominantly or mostly on the human rights of LGBTQ communities in countries that have criminalized homosexuality and hopes to find work in this field after graduation. As a cisgender, femme, queer identified individual, she is also very interested in domestic advocacy in the US through youth empowerment and education. Let's give a, some love, virtually and physically, to Claire. Thank you. Get this all hooked up. Hello, everyone. Hello. Both here and on the interwebs. Um, yep. So I wanted to start off this conversation with just a little bit of a warning. Um, we're going to be talking about a term that for a very long time and for very many people and still currently for very many people was a pejorative. Um, in this conversation, we might also be using language that has been pejoratively claimed um, or is in the process of reclamation. So just kind of giving you a warning, um, especially for those in the room that have had trauma related to these terms, um, that that is gonna be a part of the conversation that we're having today. So yeah, I mean, then that kind of starts us off, right? Uh, we've seen this term queer, and we've seen kind of a, a process and an evolution in how it's used, um, both as an umbrella term and as an individual identity. Um, myself, individually, prefer it as a sexual orientation label. Um, it is what I would refer to as my primary orientation label, and then we'll talk about secondary, secondary orientation labels as well a little bit later presentation. 
let me be perfectly queer, and I've got it on my shirt. <laughs> um, so this will just give you an idea of what this presentation is going to look like. We're going to talk about background and history. We're going to talk about evolution and personal experience. Um, real quick, imaginary bonus cookie for anyone who can name the individual who is in the picture to the far left who is not Dr. King. Bonus cookie? All right. Uh, that individual is Bayard Rustin. He was the chief organizer of the March on Washington, and he was about as out as you can get as a gay man um, during the Civil Rights Movement. So uh, definitely someone you might want to look into. Um, so yeah, we've got, this is kind of the plan for the day. So queer definition. We're going we're gonna to kind of start off with what we're what we're working with, generally speaking, here. Um, so queer, I think this is like the Google definition. Strange, odd, we've got uh, queer on um, Urban Dictionary, and then we've got one that I've kind of come across and evolved in a lot of the studies that I've been having. So a label that indicates a dynamic sexual orientation, political persuasion, and or advocacy practice that is rooted in anti-normative and radical perspectives. Uh, a lot of the conversations that we have around the term queer is kind of like, what does that mean? I don't really get it. I think it's synonymous with something bad. I'm not sure if I can say it. Um, and this is where a lot of these conversations start. And a lot of the conversations that I've had at the university um, with both faculty and staff and the student body have kind of revolved around this not really quite understanding exactly what this term means and wanting a very defined idea of what that box is and where it sits. Um, which is somewhat problematic because the term queer is really kind of trying to get at something a little broader than that. We're not really trying to pin it down. It's, Part of the popularity in the reclamation process has been that it is kind of an umbrella term and it is a little bit broader and it encompasses a lot of different spheres of identity and personality. So literature. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, kind of a mini lit review. So I would highly suggest uh, anyone that hasn't picked up Judith Butler queer theory um, do so, especially if you're really interested in this topic. It's kind of... Uh, Judith Butler is going to be the author that gets most thrown around. It's going to be kind of the, the 101 academic version of a lot of things. Um, that being said, it's also, it, it should be pointed out that part of kind of the queer label has, uh, the critique of the queer label has been a lot that it focuses very much in white academia. Um, and so being aware of this and making sure that the literature that you're picking up and trying to educate yourself with is broad. What I really want to focus on for this slide, though, is Adam Kroom. So <laughs> this would have been a Louis C.K. clip, but I'm going to talk you through it. Kroom kind of points out that reclamation of pejoratives goes through three phases. So we have paradigmatic. So that's the idea that we've created a set of language to enforce certain power dynamics. So we know that there's a lot of language that comes out of slavery. There are words that are created to enforce particular hierarchies of power. Um, and those words are continuously used in order to kind of create a feedback power loop um, through their use. Non-paradigmatic is what this clip would have been. So uh, Louis C.K. has a, a stand-up bit in which he says, you know, when I was young, we would use the term faggot, but we wouldn't call you a faggot because you were gay. We'd call you a faggot because you were being a faggot. So non-paradigmatic use is basically this idea that you're using the same word, but you're not necessarily using it in order to enforce these power hierarchies. Um, so you've kind of, you've kept the word, but taken away sort of the meaning. Um, and then we have non-derogatory in-group. So that's kind of the full circle of things. It's when a group has decided that they're going to take the word and they understand the meeting and they understand the history and they're going to reclaim it as a sense of power to kind of flip-flop these, these power hierarchies. Um, so we've seen that with the word queer, both as kind of a community-wide and as an individual. And this full sort of loop we can see in a lot of different situations. We can see it in a lot of different spheres with a lot of different words. Um, I'd also like to point on the non-derogatory in-group. The term queer has taken one step further, right? Because we, we see a lot of use from individuals who aren't queer identified, who, are say, who feel that they are comfortable using that term in a non-derogatory way. Um, we wouldn't necessarily assume someone who uses, 
uses the sentence, I really want to make sure I am being a conscious advocate for my queer friends as trying to be problematic or trying to be um, insulting in any way. So we've gone kind of out of the in-group status of this and kind of reclaimed it more as a society-wide term. Um, and people can definitely push back against that and there are certain problems that come into that as well. Um, but it's something that I wanted to point out because it's kind of this fourth step that isn't necessarily outlined by Kroom. Um, including Queer Voices by Levy and Johnson. Uh, I would highly suggest anyone that's gonna do qualitative research with the LGBTQI com community um, read Levy and Johnson. It came out in 2012 and it really just talks about how to ethically engage with communities and research, especially since the LGBTQ community has been over-researched and often unethically so, I would argue. So reclamation in the 1980s. Uh, the word queer kind of really started coming, uh, the, the word had been a pejorative use for hundreds of years. Um, I've attempted to track down the first time it was used in this way, um, and we're looking at like the 1800s. Um, now the evo there's uh, various evolutions that it's used within that. That being said, um, attempting to pin down when it was kind of connected to the LGBT community is difficult, to say the least. Um, but it started coming back into use in the 80s. Queer Nation, when you hear like, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. Um, that was a, a predominantly a Queer Nation thing, kind of put that into the populace and put that into kind of the media scene. Um, interestingly enough, we're gonna kind of have a, we're gonna have like a web, like a, a fun little LGBTQ web going on here. So Queer Nation shows up to the Arsenio Hall show in 1990, I believe, um, and basically causes a big ruckus and says, why aren't you having more gay people on your show? Arsenio Hall responds with saying, I do have gay people on my show, but it's none of your damn business about whether they're gay or not, um, which is really interesting. And you can, you can go onto YouTube and you can find these clips. Um, then in 1993, the Arsenio Hall show invites Leah Delaria on to do some stand-up comedy, um, which gets us to our next slide, actually. So within the course of the stand-up, Leah Delaria, uh, during the taping, says the words dyke, fag, and queer 47 times. Um, and believe it or not, the Fox News Network was not sure if they wanted to air that. Um, <laughs> Uh, Arsenio Hall basically says, uh, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase the quote here, um, if she's a dyke, then she can call herself a dyke and you should get the fuck over it. Um, so, uh, you know, Leah kind of, a lot of people point to Leah Delaria as kind of the first out comic, uh, talked about a lot of issues with the butch community, uh, a lot of issues with the dyke community, um, kind of this reclaiming of words. Leah Delaria has also been in the news lately for saying the above quote, and part of me believes that this inclusivity of calling us the LGBTQQTY whatever LMNOP tends to stress our differences, and that's why I refuse to do it. I say queer, queer is everybody. So this sort of brings us to the second portion of this conversation, right? Um, whether or not everyone should be called queer and kind of where queer fits into label identities in kind of a structural manner. So there are a lot of individuals that kind of have this perspective that queer should be everyone. Everyone should just call themselves queer. That being said, I, at least in my personal and academic experience, that negates a lot of work that's been done, right? Um, we're really kind of looking at the fact that people fought really hard for these labels that they use and that people should have kind of a, a self-identification with the labels that they're using. They should have a possession. They should feel like it represents them. Um, and by kind of saying that this is just a term everyone should use, it also negates the fact that there's a lot of trauma with this term. The fact that um, a lot of individuals, when you speak to them, the first use that they have of this term is playing smear the queer, um, or individuals that may have heard this term while getting kicked out of their houses after coming out. Um, there's a lot of conversation going on in the community I have found during my research and during personal interaction about whether or not this is an appropriate term, whether or not anyone should use this, whether or not everyone should use it. Um, and we'll kind of get to that when we're kind of doing the conclusions, but this is definitely a, a situation that's going on right now and a conversation that's happening that has a lot of detailed and complicated points to it um, and something that needs to continue having, having that discussion. 
So personal conclusions and questions. Um, so yeah, I mean, that kind, of, that kind of brings me to my journey on this. So I personally identify as queer. Um, it's a term I haven't always used, but one that I've definitely used for probably, I'd say, the past five to six years. Um, for me, it's a term that's just very all-encompassing, right? It's uh, my first, the first kind of official academic argument that I had heard around this term was this idea that when we're, when we're using terms outside of a queer label, that we're enforcing a binary. And at the time, I, was identif I primarily identified as a bisexual woman. Um, and I really, I had a lot of conversations about this, right? Because I was looking at the people that I was attracted to. I was looking at the people, the relationships I was having. I was looking at the research that I was doing and realizing that this binary was really something I wanted to shrug off and not support and, and not kind of feed into. Um, queer seemed like a really good label for me because it, it didn't have that kind of idea that like male and female and one or the other are both, but it has to be one or it has to be in these two groups. Um, and a lot of people that I've spoken with have kind of come to these conclusions as well. When we're looking at, when we're looking at kind of uh, primary and secondary labels, this is also, a, a lot of it's situational, right? So there's a lot of people that might be like, you know, I tell my friends that I'm queer, but I might tell like my great grandma that I'm a lesbian, if I'm telling her anything at all. Um, and it's important to recognize kind of the burden of education that comes with our labels, right? We don't always have to want to explain ourselves over and over and over again. Um, and explaining yourself once at the beginning of the day may be very different than explaining yourself for the tenth time at the end of the day. Uh, a lot of, of the critique has also kind of come around this and, and being able to take on that education in a more ethical way when you have that connection to your label. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations with classmates over at the Humphrey and just kind of this, like, what is queer? Am I allowed to say it? Like, can I, can I call you that? Um, and that's really kind of what this comes down to. It comes to having personal conversations with individuals about how they would like to be labeled and identified, if they would like to be labeled and identified. Uh, and having these conversations is really critical because most of the time when you're using these labels, the person you're talking about is not going to be in the room, right? Because um, at that point, you're kind of just hoping that they're speaking for themselves. Uh, so within this... Within this conversation, it's important to recognize people's history. It's important to recognize the trauma that they might be coming from. Um, I know a lot of older activists within the community have really felt that they fought for the labels and they, they have put in a lot of work and people have died for these labels. People have, have gone through extreme amounts of trauma. And, and so to just have kind of a new generation, as it's phrased, to have a new generation come around and be like, we're erasing all of this, everyone's gonna be queer, um, is really problematic. That being said, kind of on the other side of that critique academically has been, okay, this, this word was very much reclaimed queer nation kind of publicly, but prior to that point, it was very much white academia. It was, we are going to study the queer community. Hello, come on. We're gonna study um, you know, the queer community and we're going to um, we're going to have these conversations with, you know, this umbrella term queer. And that caused a lot of barrier and access challenges for individuals that don't fit within queer or fit within white academia. Um, and there's a lot of conversations going on kind of about accessibility and especially when we're talking about radical spaces, when we're talking about queer wanting really to be rooted in the anti-normative um, and that a lot of those conversations are happening in academia and then kind of coming out into the streets. Um, but making sure, you know, when we're talking about radical spaces, if it, you know, it's not really radical if not everyone has access to it. Um, and, and that has certainly been an aspect of this community conversation around the word queer. Um, kind of, again, back onto a more personal side. Uh, I have found that this word in international spheres is slowly starting to kind of make its way around. Um, I think predominantly this is because the media uses it as an umbrella term. Um, a lot of Western media and a lot of global North media. Uh, this is a term that I absolutely carried with me to certain parts of Botswana um, and my activism there. Um, well, actually, my, I don't want to say my activism there. I want to say my support of the activism that was going on there. 
right? And that's a whole different conversation about white activists going into non American white spaces and being like, I'm gonna help. <laughs> um, and, but also understanding and, and understanding that bringing, we're bringing our labels into these spaces, right? Um, and, and into these spaces that may, may not be wanting to make space for these labels. Um, queer is something I have certainly had conversations with to my family about. Um, had a long conversation with my mother about this, and now she gets really excited about explaining it to other people. Um, but that was a process, and that was a conversation. And I think a lot of times individuals who come out as queer, if individual, if the people around them and the loved ones around them aren't willing to kind of engage in these conversations, they result back to terms and identifiers that are more comfortable to them. So, you know, my daughter came out as queer. She's just a lesbian. Um, or, you know, and, and that's the other part of this that we haven't really touched on. I am a cisgendered woman. So the way I use queer is within my sexual orientation labels. It's not within my gender identity. Um, so I really want to point that out within this presentation, that there are gaps in my knowledge and there are gaps in my perceptions um, that could not possibly be feel, like, filled from the positionality that I'm in um, and really recognizing that and making sure that we're acknowledging this, right? We're not going to always be able to know everything. We're not going to always be able to have the perspective of everyone around us. Um, so these conversations are really what's critical. So when we kind of get back to the title of this, of this talk, right? Like, can I use the word queer? The answer is maybe. Um, it's, it's about having conversations. It's about having critical conversations. It's about not getting, you know, if, if you use this term with someone you haven't had a conversation about and they're like, you know, I'm really not, I'm really not comfortable with that, not getting defensive. It's about having this open communication and creating space in which not only an L, the LGBTQ community can chat within, but also a space in which we feel like we have the emotional energy um, and kind of the ability to speak with others and to have this educational space where we're not burdening one group or another more so. Um, that's, that's kind of where this queer conversation is at that I have, that I have recognized um, and that I, that I have encountered in my studies. Uh, and I think as we go on, it will be interesting to see how this, this evolution continues. Um, I feel like the word queer is kind of special within the vocabulary and that we've taken it beyond that in-group, non-derogatory sphere that we were talking about. Um, but also just recognizing that it's not going to be for everyone. Um, and when we run into people that are, you know, if we just everyone should be queer, we shouldn't have this alphabet soup. You know, my personal response to that is if it was, if we could stop all hate by just labeling everyone the same, we probably would have done it a while ago. Um, and that whether or not we're changing these labels, changing the perceptions of the people that need to have points of education is still going to be a lot of work. Um, and that it's not just about kind of what you smack a label on. It's about, it's about what's going on beneath that. So yeah, that is my, those are my thoughts and perspectives. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's all good. Thank you so much to Claire. Hi. Uh, <laughs> so um, we're going to transition this part here into a Q&A for the folks who are physically here. I'll be on, um, on the chat feature on your WebEx to answer, or I'm sorry, to not answer your questions for you, but to bring your questions to the space uh, for Claire and maybe anyone else in the space who'd like to answer, or, um, answer that question, all right? So with that being said, sure. questions to the audience. Awkward silence from the audience. Well, I guess this was just knowing some of your work. Is there any, um, around the term queer? Is there anything from some of the research that you've done that you could share here, or maybe it came out in some of the presentations? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So the, the question was, uh, knowing some of my background, uh, 
the, the question was if I could kind of talk about some of the research uh, that I've done on, on the term queer. So yes and no. Um, part of the research that I've done and the most recent research study, uh, part of the waivers for that and the confidentiality notices for that were that a lot of that information was destroyed after the class was done. Um, and also that we promised that we kind of wouldn't publish and wouldn't, I would consider this publishing. It's, it's going into the interwebs. Um, that being said, I mean, I, I think kind of touching on, on broad concepts, uh, looking at the fact that a lot of individuals who use the term queer kind of have a secondary label that they'll revert to in situation, like, situation, like different situations, they'll use different labels. Um, I've certainly on a personal note found that to be true. Uh, I, I'm a practicing Catholic. I don't necessarily come out <laughs> when I'm having conversations about how these two communities don't get along <laughs> almost ever. <laughs> um, I, the, queer is not necessarily something I throw it around because I feel like oftentimes that puts me in a center, that puts my identity at the center of the conversation as opposed to we're having a conversation about how this institution that I'm involved in is not very kind to another community that I'm involved in and that I identify with. So. Um, trying to think of like ways to make sure we're not breaking confidentiality in this space. Um, yeah, kind of a, a lot of, a lot of coming into con the, the um, kind of first point of contact and individuals hearing the term queer first as a pejorative prior to an, ide an identifier that they might have adopted. Um, but yeah, I'm probably, I'm probably gonna cut it off at that for, but yeah, no, absolutely. We have a question from online. Awesome! Thanks, online. <laughs> I know, right? Um, question is: They were wondering if that if you could share and or speak about potential like any new research or any research at all um, that is bringing in more racially racially perspective. I'm sorry, racially diverse perspectives. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question <laughs> into the microphone. So the question was if I could share any information or research that's being done uh, from more racially diverse perspectives. Mm -hmm. ah, so kind of yes and kind of no. Um, part of the reason that I did the research that I did last year was because most of the time when we run into research um, about this term, it's used as an umbrella. It's not used as specific identities. Um, that being said, also just generally as an umbrella, there's a lack of research. Uh, I am sure that, or I would hope that, um, that is a perspective that's being taken. Um, I know that especially as we kind of become more accustomed to using terms like um, uh, QPOC, mm -hmm. Uh, that that would be a research perspective that needs to be taken. I, I can tell you that at the time that the lit review was done for the research I did last year, we didn't find any. Um, because that was certainly something that we were looking into was, okay, you know, we had, we had kind of heard through personal interactions that this was a mostly white academic term. Okay, can we find anything about that? And we, we didn't find a whole lot. Um, that being said, we were also using very, very academic research methods. Um, so, and that, right, and that creates barriers and excludes a lot of groups of individuals. So it doesn't mean that it's not out there. Um, I would say there's not enough of it. I would absolutely say that there's not enough of it. Um, I think a lot of the research, I, well, I wouldn't, uh, a lot of the perspective and a lot of the media that's coming out around that is more around op-eds and blogs and kind of uh, perspective pieces. So um, I definitely think that kind of that, that angle on the research is lacking and we need to have more of it. Yeah. I really liked the definition that you shared at the beginning mm -hmm. of queer being a dynamic sexual orientation, political mm -hmm. persuasion, and advocacy practice. Can you mm -hmm. talk more about the political and advocacy mm -hmm. implications of using queer as a label? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I can kind of talk from uh, the literature perspective as well as my own. Um, can you the oh yes, I can repeat the question. <laughs> so uh, the the question was that um, 
the, about the, the definition that I put up at the beginning on the first slide about queer being connected to kind of political um, practice and kind of speaking more as to the, the connection between the political, I was about to say the personal, <laughs> um, uh, the political and the term queer. So a lot of, when I say that queer started becoming reclaimed in white academia, it was also white academia that had labeled itself radical, right? Because at that time, we're looking at the fact that um, HIV AIDS is being spoken about. Um, the FDA is not approving drugs quick enough to save people li people's lives. We're seeing a lot of people dying. We're seeing a lack of response from the US government. So when we're seeing a ra reclamation of queer, we're seeing it within protest spaces. And we're seeing it within Queer Nation did a lot of stuff with disruptive protesting, right? and kind of inserting the Arsenio Hall show was an example of that. It was, we're going to go and be members of this group, and then we are going to make sure the cameras get turned on to us. Um, and, and kind of entering, I know kind of another tactic of theirs was to enter into bars that were typically straight and play uh, what they called like heteronormative party games. So they'd play spin the bottle in the middle of straight bars to be like, if you get to be all out and sexual, we get to be all out and sexual too. Um, so, I mean, from the reclamation aspect of things, I think that because that group was mostly, because that group had kind of started putting it into the public sphere that, that it inherently was connected with radical. Um, I know for myself personally, queer is having these, like, so, so radical for me is more within an education sphere, right? Um, it's within an education sphere, particularly with youth, particularly with youth that feel like they haven't been given space to voice their identities. Um, and I think for me, it's critical to connect queer with the radical and queer with the political, almost because the outside world has made it political, almost because um, queer theory has been politicized in the sense, there was a lot of conversation around um, human rights campaign, right? And the, and the fight for marriage, and that the fight for marriage was great, unless you didn't want to get married. <laughs> um, and, and that when we're fighting for kind of, and when I, just to get everybody on the same page, when I say heteronormative, um, I mean kind of this sense that uh, the assumption of heterosexuality, um, kind of the assumption when we're getting into kind of the more radical spheres of that, the assumption that you want like one man and one woman and 2.5 kids and a dog and a picket fence. Um, and there was a lot of conversations around human rights campaign being like, well, maybe I want a wife and another wife and like a gerbil. Um, and, or, or maybe I don't wanna get married and maybe I don't wanna have kids or um, this idea that just because this is the community that the hetero, like a, the heterosexual community, had established these norms. They didn't be. They didn't need to be norms for us. Um, they also could be. They could be anything. We could be. We could be bigger. We could be. We could be more expansive. So I think when people think about the word queer, and I think when a lot of people decide to adopt that as an identifier, it's very much related in political disruption of what we assume is normal and what we've been told is normal and what we've been taught is normal. So yeah. <laughs> I had a recent conversation with a youth group leader where all of the participants identify as pansexual. Mm, mm -hmm. So as the um, use of the word queer as an umbrella term moves more towards a political aspect, do you think there'll be an increase in using pansexual as a sexual orientation identification? I'm going to so, <laughs> <right? laughs> repeat that question. So. Uh, Ooh, I'm going to try to repeat that question. So it was uh, the, the kind of the crux of it was the idea that as queer moves more towards an umbrella term, uh, do I think that the use of the, of the identifier pansexual will become more popular as an individual? Uh, right? Yes? Yep, more okay. Or less, yep. More or less. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, I do. I think, let me think on this one for a minute. So. It's a little bit, so as a, as a queer identified individual, it's sometimes frustrating when a personal identity is only used as an umbrella term for me. Um, and that's, that's my feelings on that. Um, I don't think it's necessarily problematic, though it is certainly putting a lot of people into one box and a lot of people that don't want to be in that box. I think pansexual is absolutely going to become more popular. I'm not sure if it's because queer will move more towards umbrella term status. Um, as much as it is, people will understand what pansexual is and will run into that word. Um, 
and I, I think kind of as the education grows and as and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm going to try to put a definition of pansexual and please feel free to correct me on this. Um, a pansexual person or a pansexual identified person is someone who is attracted to individuals irregardless of um, gender identity or representation. Hearts not parts. Hearts not parts. I like that should be. It. I'm gonna get that T-shirt for the next thing. Hearts not parts. So I, you know I think. Yeah, I think pansexual is going to become more pop. I, I hope that it is. I hope, I, I'm definitely not in kind of the Leah Delaria camp. I think people should be able to use whatever hell label they want and like it's none of my business, right? Um, my, my business is, is that I want to respect your label. That's where, that's where my people parts come into like other people's realms um, is wanting to make sure that I'm respecting the identity labels that people have, have claimed for themselves. Um, so yeah, I think pansexual will become more popular because I think the conversation is becoming more popular. Um, I hope queer doesn't just become an umbrella thing. <laughs> then I'm going to be over here and like my t-shirt's no longer relevant. <laughs> um, so yeah, that would, that would be my answer to that. I think as more people understand what pansexual is, you'll, you'll have more people being like, hey, that's, that's totally me. That's going to be me now. So yeah. Well, aren't there two different types of queers too? There's like a gender queer, mm -hmm. such as myself, and then there's an orientation queer. Yes. Well. Yep. And, and we you just don't hear like the queer that you're talking about mm -hmm. is an orientation queer. Absolutely. Just, the, the, the word orientation is kind of like silent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the point that had been brought up, it wasn't really a question, like the point that had been brought up, um, just so that everyone can hear on the interwebs, um, is kind of that there's two two kind of camps with queer and uh, gender queer gender queer individuals and queer individuals via their sexual orientation labels and there absolutely is um, and I that had kind of been like a um, something I touched on a little bit earlier is that like I can't speak from the gender queer perspective because I'm a cisgendered individual and that is I would uh, there was a lot of chat with some of the research I've done about including gender queer individuals and feeling like it would not be ethical to enter that space as a cisgendered person um, and especially as a cisgendered researcher, and especially as a cisgendered researcher from a university that doesn't always have like the best qualitative methods when it comes to engaging with communities that are studied over and over and over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, no, I would I would completely agree with that. I think I think that the conversation will be different depending on the use. I, I remember my question. Oh yeah, give me a question. Um, okay, so I came across the term within feminist theory mm -hmm. the other day, um, if it's personal, it's political. Yeah, personal. So what political. does it mean when things go political? Like, mm -hmm. I know you mentioned when queer like goes political, will there be more pansexual people? What What does that mean to go for like a term to even go po political? Mm -hmm. And is it a good or is it a bad or is it <laughs> somewhere like? I know there's no such thing. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, what happens kind of, uh, the, the, the feminist term kind of the personal is political and what happens when, when something goes from kind of the personal realm to the political realm. Um, my, and there would be a lot of different perspectives on that. <laughs> my particular perspective is that usually the in-group doesn't make anything political. It's the larger majority group that makes something political. Um, so things like reproductive rights. Right, it, you know, kind of in an, in my opinion, in an ideal world, like a woman's body would not be something that the government is regulating. It is made political because we have put laws into, into a space in which we're saying you can or cannot do certain things with your body. When it comes to kind of the term queer, it happens that way, queer within the sexual orientation realm. It happens that way with our relationships, right? Um, the queer is made political when we are told that we can't serve openly in the military. Queer is made political when we are told we can't marry. Queer is made political when we're told we can't get visas for our loved ones. Um, queer is absolutely, I, I, the largest combination of those two spheres I can think of is queer is made political when someone is on their deathbed and their loved one is not allowed into the room. Like that's all, that's all kinds of messed up. Um, so I would, I would make the argument that the transition happens because the at-large broader, broader society decides that there are going to be rules and regula regulations about people's personal lives or identities. Is that, did that kind of hit it? That was definitely another perspective. Like okay. I'm just like trying to 
trying to find out what that term means to other people, like to yeah. other people. Yeah, no, and that's what it means, that's what it means to me, so. Because for me, it, it feels like when, you know, there are a lot of people like looking at me, you know, kind of like questioning like with their eyes, like, you know, what, what I am, and it gets mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, gets to feel a little personal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just kind of think to myself that, okay, well, maybe this is hitting some sort of political thing. Mm. You know, like maybe these people came across something like within their mainstream research about like transgenders or like gender queers. Mm -hmm. You know, they're kind mm -hmm. of like observing me. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would definitely say that education is political, right? When we're when we're going through that education and and a, a person's inherent want either that they've gotten from formal education or from kind of like societal education where they're like I need to identify you and I need to figure I need to figure out which box I can put you in in order to like reasonably and ethically like communicate with you or to interact um, so no I mean that's a that's an amazing perspective and certainly not one that like a cisgendered queer person would necessarily run into especially like I'm relatively femme presenting most days, so. Yeah, I dig it. I'm loving the lipstick, by the way. Work uh, that. Me too, Jeffree Star. Work that, ooh. Yeah, Jeffree Star Cosmetics. I've been testing <laughs> for about a month now, and I have no complaints. Jeffree Star. Like, it, it goes on, not, like, not promotional. <laughs> <laughs> this is not. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's all good. It's all good. I was actually impressed with the product. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So I, yeah. if I could, I know, again, we have a couple more minutes, but yeah. I think that the frame of the conversation is um, this idea of can I say queer. Mm -hmm. and yes. again, I mentioned yep. earlier, yep. I know that you gave some um, great bullet points, but I kind of want to make sure that they get like yep. put up to the front. What happens mm -hmm. on our campuses, off of our campuses, when there is pushback, yep. again, for centering the term in identities of mm -hmm. trans and particularly queer? Mm -hmm. What do we do? What are some tools that we could use and or say to do some kind of education? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How do we lean in better? Yeah. It could be a, a divisive, quote unquote, divisive conversation. Absolutely. What are those tips again? Mm -hmm. So I'm um, repeating into the mic. Um, <laughs> tips when we're having conversations and kind of lean in methods when we're talking about queer and trans issues and those terms and, and who relates or not relates to those, to those particular terms. Um, I mean, I would definitely, the conversation is the important part, right? Um, not making assumptions, make an ass of you and me. Um, it's, it's making sure, so, so the, the fact that the office engaged in conversations with the community when there was this name change, right? And that you all, you all probably got a lot of pushback and especially from individuals who might be older and have gone through different decades who now have money that they can give back to university institutions, um, but who also went through like this, pro you know, probably the majority of their lives have ha has seen this as a pejorative term, as like a really bad term and something that was probably very much thrown at them um, without consent. So I think the conversation is the critical part, understanding that even when we use queer as an umbrella term, we may be using it for people that aren't comfortable with it as an individual term. Um, and making space when we're using terms like queer for individuals that are not down with that. Um, and making sure that we're making space to allow individuals to voice those opinions and to engage in that conversation in an authentic way. Um, I think Big paintbrushes are always dangerous, right? Uh, making comments like everyone should just be this way. Um, you know, think about that particular sentence in the context of like if it was, if it was the argument against marriage. Like, well, this is just what marriage should be. Um, making sure that people are feeling seen. I know as, as a as a person who like very much femme presents, a really large agitation for me is when I walk into a gay bar and someone's like, where's your boyfriend? And I'm like, oh no, 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 no. Um, like I shouldn't have to wear this shirt, right? But I do and I, I've, I like wear rainbow things as name tags and, and the less we force people to do those types of things, the better off we are. The better off we are and the better off we are as a community. Um, so engaging in the conversation, understanding that even when we adopt this as an umbrella term, that it, everyone under the umbrella might not be down. 
um, and making sure that the communication doesn't stop, right? So who knows how long the off like the Office for Queer and Trans Life maybe the the name the title for the next you know however many decades, the conversation should never stop. Um, we should make sure that we're we keep having it. Like there's not a definitive end to this, right? Um, and as as the term evolves and as society evolves, it may be something that can be something that can be kind of ushered out of different levels of importance, but it doesn't mean that we don't create space for it and that we don't, it doesn't mean that we shut down the opportunity to engage in conversation um, and promote that and actively promote that and proactively promote that. Um, so yeah, and then just really, really, you know, asking people and putting yourself into a comfortable situation where, hey, like, you know, it's same thing with pronouns. If if someone's comfortable having that conversation and and they're willing to do the education, making sure that you're seeing them and being like, you know, thank you so much for sharing that personal part of yourself. I'll make sure that I'm respecting that. Um, not always putting the burden of education on people who use these identity labels, right? Um, yes. Right? All the time. Because you don't want to, like, I, like, sometimes I'm just like, call my mother. She'll explain to you because I've had that conversation about what queer is and I can't have it with you anymore. <laughs> background information on what gender is. Right. And that's like, that's a PhD level class. It was, It is. Yeah. And it's a lot of responsibility that yeah. suddenly, like, I am trapped into, like, taking on in, mm -hmm. like, a two-second decision. Yep. Exactly. And not putting people on the spot. So I've, I've heard of situations in which um, individuals' genders or their sexual orientations are made as, like, a like a teaching moment within a classroom. And, ha and that's super messed up and inappropriate. Um, so yeah, I would I would kind of say that that these are things to keep in mind when we're talking about whether or not, you know, I can use queer. Um, and certainly, you know, if if queer is something you think resonates with you, you can use queer for you all you want, um, and know that and own it. And if that's something that you want, like take it take it on and be strong in that. I'll talk about this all day, folks. <laughs> oh yeah. So you mentioned. Mm -hmm. conversation and queerness. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do you have any ideas about how to mitigate those barriers for future research? And how do we have those conversations with now with people who are experiencing those barriers? Or, or I should say, for whom those barriers exist now? Mm -hmm. uh, so the question was about academic barriers and kind of the fact that we're, we're talking about queerness and academic barriers with people of color and, and how, we, how we mitigate those and how we how we can kind of help individuals that are hitting those barriers right now. Yes, roughly? Cool. Um, one is we need more people of color in universities <laughs> um, and academic settings. And I, I yeah, um, I think, because the other thing that's scary is that when you have white academics interacting with certain communities and not always in a conscious way that that can be really dangerous. Um, I think there are ways to do that ethically and reasonably, um, but it requires a lot of education and a lot of knowledge about positionality. And I think a lot of qualitative work is getting, my experience at this university has been that it's getting better and that those conversations are being had and that we understand um, kind of what positions of power we're, we're walking in with when we walk into certain communities. Um, I think having, I mean, like funding would be great, right? Um, we need to recognize that these are our research points of view of worth, um, that they add to the academic body. We need to understand that we have a long, long, endless history in this country of like white and white being positioned as like the highest power in the land. Um, and that in order to break that down, we need to not only recognize that, but then also bring the communities up that we have trampled on for a real long time. Um, so yeah, money, faculty, I would say also faculty, a lot of the people, and that's, you know, we need to diversify faculty, we need to diversify student bodies, we also need to make sure that like, like, education K through 12 is more diversified and has more money going in and that we're not, um, we're not 
losing people along the way. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from white academics needing to con consciously and consistently be questioning this power and questioning this funding and questioning the communities that we're walking into. Um, and doing that might feel a little awkward and like a little like, oh, like this feels icky to me, but like lean into the awkward, like lean into the icky, like try, it's real hard not to be defensive and I totally get that sometimes with conversations that you're having, but like really try to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Like, <laughs> It's, it's gonna be okay. Um, but I think recognizing that that's an issue is kind of the first step in a very long healing process that higher ed has with communities of color in this country. We As the white person. <laughs> we are at yeah. time, so I just want to give a thank you for Claire doing this. Oh yeah, do you, do you need the mic? To I'm talking to yeah. myself. Yeah. I wanted to thank Claire for doing this, hi. Um, and also let you all know, um, and just think about one quick thing if, if I could inter um, add about the term queer and you asked a question about mitigating it out of academics and think about what happens in terms of language outside of academics, right, or of the academy anyway, because I don't think the queer was a term that was directly like grew out of the academy, it was obviously an activism in the community. And I think a lot about other terms that are used that are either seen as um, inappropriate. And I think oftentimes within the, the black community, as I say, the N word, because if I say it out loud, and who gets to use it, who doesn't, where are the critiques coming from, who, who feels uncomfortable about it. And so I do think that one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is who gets the opportunity and privilege to use language? as a gay, black, identified person, queer, N-word, et cetera, where do I get to use my language and where do I don't? So I'm gonna wrap it up with that. It's something to think about, just to kind of hold on to. I wanna say our next Queer X Topics conversation will be on uh, October 14th, same time, 12 to 1 p.m. on a Friday, and it's, the conversation is on queer sustainability, so connecting the environment that we live in and how do we sustain ourselves personally as queer communities and the, the world that we walk on. Um, please tune in for that. I wanna thank you again, thank Claire for being here and being so phenomenal. And we will keep um, videos, hopefully, we will keep videos of this, this presentation and others online. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day.